People talk about the luck of the Irish. We know the Irish made their own luck. They say that everyone is Irish on St. Patrick's Day, but that wasn't always the case. Some claimed the Irish could never be true Americans, but it was an Irish immigrant who refused to bow the American flag before a king, and the grandson of Irish immigrants who told the Nazis, nuts, they have sweated in the bowels of the earth and reached for the stars. They have performed miracles, spoken for the marginalized, entertained us, inspired us, deliberately walked into hell to save us. They are the children of exiles, committed to the present, yet never forgetting where they came from. We all have experienced tough times this past year, but the Irish are no strangers to tough times and will rebuild our communities stronger than ever. March is Irish American Heritage Month. Good morning to our friends on the West Coast. Good evening to our friends from Ireland. And good afternoon to our friends on the East Coast. Welcome to Lincoln and the Irish with Neil O'Dowd. I'm Danny O'Connell, National President of the Ancient Order Hibernians. Today is the fourth and final webinar in our 2021 Irish American Heritage Month program in conjunction with the Irish Government Heritage Grant program. Today, we begin with our largest pre-registration uh, of the year, which is a credit to the first three programs and presenters, um, as well as to Neil O'Dowd, today's presenter. Joining Neil and I today um, as uh, presenters are Neil Cosgrove, Irish American Heritage Month Chairman for the Ancient Order Hibernians, Daniel Taylor, AOH National Historian, Ned McGinley, past president of the Ancient Order Hibernians, and maybe the only one of us who remembers the Civil War. Neil Cosgrove, as I said already, our Irish American Heritage Month Chairman, and I was looking at Liam McNabb, our national treasurer, and serves as treasurer. His mom always tells me he's a treasurer. I got to get that correct. And of course, the uh, brains behind the whole system is Chris Cook, our uh, state president from North Carolina, as well as our national coordinator of digital services. And at now, I'll turn it over to our chair for national history, Daniel Taylor. Thank you, Danny. Uh, as you mentioned, this is the final of our series of webinars uh, this Irish Heritage Month. And there's been a common thread that has run through the series, which is the impact of Angorta Moor, the Great Hunger, on other significant historical events. We have heard uh, how the flood of Irish immigrants coming to America created a powerful and cohesive interest group here in support of the movement for independence back home in Ireland. We have heard of the significant contributions those same immigrants made to the labor movement here in the United States. And just last week, we had historian Damon Shields sharing with us his original re research uh, with fascinating insight into Irish participation in the American Civil War from the perspective of the individual soldiers and their families. And today, we will be examining the role of the Irish in the Civil War, but from a different perspective. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president and the commander in chief of those many thousands of Irish soldiers who served in the Union forces is undoubtedly the most studied figure of the 19th century. Every aspect of Lincoln's life has been documented, analyzed and examined. And yet there is a remarkable void both in academia and in the popular culture in our understanding of Lincoln's interaction with and attitudes toward those Irish Americans who were so instrumental in the union effort. Our guest today, Neil O'Dowd, has stepped up to fill that gap with his book, Lincoln and the Irish, the untold story of how the Irish helped Abraham Lincoln save the union. Uh, Neil needs no introduction to many of you, I'm sure. Born in County Tipperary, Neil came to the United States in 1978, shortly after he completed a bachelor's degree at University College Dublin. And once here, he embarked on a career as a sort of serial entrepreneur in the field of journalism. Neil established the Irishman newspaper in San Francisco, later the Irish America magazine in New York, and then the Irish Voice, a national newspaper. 
And in 2009, of course, he created the wildly successful Irish Central website. Along the way, Neil played an important role in the peace process in the North of Ireland, serving as an intermediary between Sinn Féin and the Clinton White House, and very notably being instrumental in President Clinton's decision to grant Jerry Adams a visa to enter the United States. Neil has also been an advocate for the undocumented Irish in America and was a founder of the Irish Lobby for Immigration Reform in 2005. Neil was granted an honorary doctorate by his alma mater, UCD, in 2004 for his work on the peace process. And in 2014, he was presented with the Presidential Distinguished Service Award given to those of Irish citizenship and descent who have made a sustained contribution to Ireland or Irish communities abroad by Irish President Michael D. Higgins. In addition to Lincoln and the Irish, Neil is the author of Fire in the Morning, an account of the events of 9-11 as they affected the Irish American community. Uh, he's the author of the autobiographical An Irish Voice, and most recently has published A New Ireland, which is Neil's look at political and cultural evolution in Ireland. I'm pleased uh, to introduce Neil O'Dowd to talk to us about Lincoln and the Irish. Thank you very much, and thank you to the AOH for this opportunity, and congratulations on stepping up in a month that was so difficult for so many people in terms of the fact that St. Patrick's Day was never going to be the same this year. And the fact that you guys did such a great job with your own programs filled a huge void and I'm very proud to be part of it. Um, the story I'm going to tell is a truly remarkable story because it's been overlooked for so long. It's, it's almost sinful for the Irish not to know the history and the impact they had on in my opinion, probably the greatest American president, perhaps even the greatest man in history, Abraham Lincoln, who saved democracy in the United States. Um, uh, there is 15,000 books on Lincoln. None of them deal anything with his Irish background or people he dealt with who were on popular on Irish issues at the time. And if you remember the Ken Burns Civil War piece, the series on PBS a number of years ago, there was not a single mention of the fact that 125,000 Irish fought for Lincoln in the American Civil War. And in fact, were instrumental, there's no question about it, at Gettysburg in securing the victory for the Union side at a, cru at a crucial part in that, in that battle. But I'd like to take you back to Wednesday, April 26, 1865. And that was when the US mail ship, the Marseillaise, approached the Irish coast. Now the Marseillaise had just picked up the cross-Atlantic uh, mail boat which had sailed from New York the week before, two weeks before. It took 12 days at the, time, <clears throat> at the time for news to reach Europe about what had happened in America. And what was the biggest story of the 19th century was on board that ship that day. It was the assassination of President Lincoln, which took 12 days to reach Europe because it was one year later, it would have reached in eight minutes because the transatlantic cable was working. But it made one man famous, a man called William Ju Paul Julius Reiter, who you know from Reuters News ever since. And he made his reputation on the death of Lincoln, breaking the story in Europe. And the way he did it was he situated a watch group at Crosshaven, 30 miles north of the, the port of Cove, or as it was then known as Queenstown. And he sent a, a boat out to the ship, the Marseillaise, to get the latest news, which was contained in a canister. And they brought it back to Crosshaven. And within the contents of the, car of the canister was the incredible news that the President of the United States had been assassinated. And that first hit land and hit Europe on April 26th, 1865, and was immediately the biggest story of the century. But it was interesting because it linked Lincoln into one of the most important relationships he had in his life, which was with the Irish Americans. And I'd like to tease out that relationship and talk about it and just mention that when I went looking for sources, just like Danny has said and the other speakers have said, it's really quite shameful that there hasn't been an awful lot of work more done on the, on the, tray, on the links between Lincoln and those of Irish heritage. Um, William Tolstoy said, 
The greatness of Napoleon, Caesar or Washington are only moonlight compared to the son of Lincoln, rating him the greatest leader of all time. And obviously we know his story, but we also need to know his wife's story. Mary Todd Lincoln's great grandfather was a native of Longford and she, he came to America and they settled in Kentucky. And she became obviously Lincoln's wife, but she wasn't particularly a person who liked the Irish. In fact, she didn't like the Irish. And the reason she didn't like the Irish was that she had all Irish girls working in her home and paid them very poorly during the upbringing of her kids. Um, she got the women from a group called the Women's Protective Immigration Society, which was created in New York for orphan women or young women who came to America. And as you know, a million Irish came to America in that period. And just to put it in context, there were 23 million Americans and 1 million Irish joined in post famine years. So it was a huge influx. And many of these people, of course, came on their own and were very young. And Mary Todd Lincoln ordered maids basically from this group and paid them exactly a dollar a week. And her Irish, our Irish nannies remember referring to her as Hellcat because she was very, very hard to deal with. Uh, but th they had a totally different experience with Abraham Lincoln. In fact, they spoke incredibly highly of him. And uh, one girl, Catherine Jordan, who was fired by Mary because she left her windows open uh, so that her lover could come into the house. Um, she was paid an extra dollar a week by Lincoln to keep his wife calm. She had an amazing gift at uh, straightening out Mary Lincoln who had these ferocious temper attacks. And Mary Jordan or, or Catherine Jordan was the only one who could handle her. It's a fascinating piece of Arcadia about, about Lincoln. Uh, other Irish maids he had was Mary Johnson and M Margaret Ryan. And there's a lot of emphasis that they first began to show him and interest him in Ireland. In fact, he learned Robert Emmett's speech from the dock from one of his maids, uh, Mary Johnson. There was another maid called Margaret Ryan who was very influential in teaching him about Ireland and what, it, what, what the famine had done to Ireland. So right at the very beginning of his career, we see this big confluence of Irish influence on, on Abraham Lincoln, not on his wife. And his wife wrote, wrote to relatives in, um, in Kentucky saying she was sick of dealing with the wild Irish that she had to deal with. And she suggested that they all vote for Fillmore, who was a know nothing president to keep the Irish out. So there was a very interesting contrast between how Abraham Lincoln and his wife perceived the Irish. She perceived them as poor workers who made her life hell. He perceived them as basically angels who kept his wife calm and looked after his kids. Um, he also had contact with Robert Emmett through 1856. The National Republican Convention was chaired by the nephew of Robert Emmett, whose name was also Robert Emmett. And Right at the beginning, you can see this fixation with Robert Emmett. Lincoln would, as a matter of course, quote the entire speech from the dock. And in fact, a Republican congressman, or rather a Democratic congressman, used his familiarity with Robert Emmett to recite the Robert Emmett poem to Lincoln in the hope of getting a pardon for a deserter. So it was obvious that Robert Emmett was a reasonably large figure in President Lincoln's life. Now, when he became a congressman, President Lincoln was focused on a lot of, uh, Congressman Lincoln was focused on a lot of issues dealing with international affairs, which would surprise a lot of people because he was from a very remote part of Kentucky, obviously. But right from the beginning, he was very interested, particularly in the Hungarian Revolution. And he was one of a handful of people who signed a resolution asking that the leader of Hungary called a man called Kossuth be allowed to run his country in a democratic way. And Lincoln talked about in his uh, congressional speech, the British treatment of Ireland and the treatment of William Smith O'Brien and strangely enough, John Mitchell who would later become an enemy and saying that he didn't think that 
the English would treat the Hungarian Revolution very fairly or want to be part of it or want to ensure that it was a fight for freedom because of the way they had treated the Irish. So right away, you get the sense that Lincoln was favorably disposed to the Irish. He made it an issue in his election. He made it an issue when he went to Congress. Again, it's information that hasn't been widely circulated, but Lincoln was clearly aware of the Irish situation from a very early age. And one of the fascinating things that um, I came across was Lincoln was not a very handsome man, as we all know. In fact, he was quite ugly. A lot of opponents called him one of the ugliest people they'd ever seen. But it was an Irish photographer, Matthew Brady, who created the image of Lincoln the way today we know the, the image of, you know, President Kennedy or President Trump or President Biden is shaped on media. Back then, your image was shaped by a photograph. And Matthew Brady, even though he claimed he was born in Saratoga Springs, New York, was actually born in Ireland. There is no evidence of him being born in Saratoga Springs, but in the US census, his parents write down that he was born in Ireland. So I think it's a reasonable assumption. And he became the greatest photographer of his day. And he took the I, I, iconic photograph of Lincoln that has been used ever since. And in that photo, he, he did what we would now call photoshopping because he realized that Lincoln actually was quite ugly and he wanted to make a better photograph of him. So he took away, he made his neck collar much bigger. He made him clench his hands to make his hands shorter and he made him relax to take these harsh lines. And then he bathed his face in light to hide the wrinkles and the, the uh, unsightliness of things on his face. So what came out was something that absolutely delighted Lincoln. And he later said that Matthew Brady ensured that he became president because that photograph, which was very flattering to Lincoln, became the photograph that became the iconic one of him. So right away, you had this um, connection with the Irish through Matthew Brady, who uh, after Lincoln was killed, was uh, asked to photograph the scene of the assassination and uh, recreate the assassination uh, scenario. And so they stayed friends all their life. And unfortunately for Brady, um, he was a huge fan of Lincoln. He was very distraught about what happened to him. Um, Lincoln himself was clearly in favor of the Irish. There was a politician called Hannigan from Ohio who got replaced in the political coup. And he stated that it was very unfortunate because Hannigan was a very, very good friend of his and also a very large share of the sprightliness and generousness which characterizes the Irish was evident in Hannigan, according to Lincoln. Again, at a time when an awful lot of people of his peer group were very anti-Irish, um, Lincoln did not have the anti-Irish sentiment of his friends. In fact, he used to tell a lot of Irish jokes, not, not very negative jokes, but jokes that reflected some funny aspect of the Irish rather than a very negative aspect. But we also know that he came into contact with a man called James Shields. And I know that uh, you may have referred to this last week with Damien Shields in terms of him talking about the Civil War. But James Shields is a fascinating character from County Tyrone who emigrated to America to he, to uh, lived with his uncle, but when he came to America from Tyrone, his uncle had actually been uh, deceased. So he was an orphan in America and through incredible fortitude and work, he became a functioning lawyer and politician in the little town of Springfield, Massachusetts, or Springfield, Illinois. And he was a Democrat and his big opponent was a guy called Abraham Lincoln. And they didn't get on because Lincoln was of the opposite party and it's one of the most strange incidents in Lincoln's life. But he started sending anonymous letters about Shields to the newspaper. They're called the Rebecca letters and they make fun of Shields. And Shields was very upset about them because he was a very, very good looking man, very popular with the women. And what happened was that this was referred to in these Rebecca poems and they were clearly aimed at undermining Shields and the policies he was following. So Shields 
went to the editor of the paper who was publishing these Rebecca poems and demanded to know who was sending them in anonymously. And the editor, strangely enough, uh, told him the truth that it was James, it was Abraham Lincoln, and more, uh, more interestingly, his wife who was making up the worst of the poems, Mary Lincoln. So Shields challenges Lincoln to a duel. And this is a moment when American history could have changed so dramatically because the duel actually went ahead. They met in a field uh, in the state of Missouri where dueling was uh, still legal. And Lincoln had the right to choose the weapons and he chose a broad sword, which was a huge cavalry sword that it took two hands to hold and suited Lincoln because he was six foot six and Shields was five foot nine. And Lincoln would have been far more able to hit uh, Shields with the broadsword than he would, than, than Shields would have been to hit uh, Lincoln first. But at the very last moment, Shields' seconds intervened and stopped the, um, the duel happening. And in fact, Shields and Lincoln subsequently became very good friends, and Shields became a high ranking officer in the Union Army and fought on behalf of, of Lincoln. But it's an amazing moment in history. And, Lincoln often referred to it that it was the saddest moment of his life that he agreed to the duel, that he almost carried it out, and that he was totally wrong to do it. But again, you have this Irish influence uh, of an individual who woke up Lincoln to the fact of Irish ethnicity and Irish heritage. And then you've got to remember that um, Lincoln was alive, uh, you know, in terms of but what was happening with the Irish famine and the attempts to uh, get aid from America for survivors of the Irish famine. And the historian Christine Kennelly discovered that Lincoln gave the sum of $10, which would be $500 today for famine relief in Ireland, which was a, a huge thing to do at the time, given the fact that uh, it wasn't generally well accepted that people from the famine era were not liked in America. Um, they were known as the dirty Irish, as the rabble. Uh, in Lincoln's town of Springfield, they were living in the worst neighborhood called the Chicken Hatch, where they were did the dirty work on the railroads, they did the dirty work on the canals, they did the dirty work on any kinds of level of construction. Um, so, you know, um, it was a time when you have to remember the know nothings were very active. And in 1855, they killed 20 Irish in St. Louis, or sorry, in Kentucky, um, because they had the temerity to go and vote that day. So it was a very tough period of being anti-Irish sentiment in America. But in all of Lincoln's writing, you never find him being anti-Irish. You find him telling these jokes, you find him talking about the Irish, but unlike his law partner who wanted to basically kill every Irish person, Herndon hated them and knew that they were anti-Lincoln or felt that they were anti-Lincoln. Lincoln himself was remarkably uh, eloquent about how much he admired the Irish and what they were struggling for. And when he made his point about never becoming a known nothing, one of the reasons he said was he wasn't going to be anti-Black and then anti-Catholic and then anti-Irish so that he was never going to join the known nothings, which is a very important statement by him at the time. Um, so you're looking at Lincoln's career, um, at one point he was running for election and this is one incident with the Irish that uh, was not a positive one from his point of view. Um, he was running for a local election and he got the information that the Irish were stuffing the ballot boxes. So he went down to the, the voting place with an axe handle and threatened the Irish because he knew they weren't going to vote for him. And uh, they eventually went away. But again, you don't see Lincoln bearing the grudge, which is interesting, even after that event. Now, the hero of the Irish at the time was Stephen Douglas, because Stephen Douglas was the opponent of Lincoln, who went out to the work camps where the Irish were, got their votes. And in many cases, this is interesting from an AOH point of view, he had an AOH bodyguard with him in many places where he went to pushing forward the fact that he was pro-Catholic and pro-Irish and against the know-nothings, 
whereas Lincoln was head of the Republican Party, the new Republican Party. And here's a very difficult concept for people to retain. Lincoln, uh, the, the Republican Party, the new Republican Party was anti-slavery, but also anti-Irish, which is a hard conundrum to accept that you can be both anti-slavery and anti-Irish, but that's how they were. But Lincoln missed out on the anti-Irish part, which was a really huge issue between him and Douglas, because Douglas tried to bring up the Irish and try to use the Irish vote against Lincoln. And uh, he did so by going to these camps and embracing the Irish, getting the AOH on his side, funny enough, and very understandably because he was standing up for the Irish. Um, but despite it all, Lincoln wins the election despite uh, Douglas's reach, outreach to the Irish. Lincoln wins the election and he ends up in the White House. And this is where his Irish connections become extraordinary in many ways. Um, because the first guy he meets is Ed McManus, who's been the doorman at the White House for seven different US presidents. And he becomes Lincoln's, he's from Roscommon, he's an older man, and he becomes the only guy in the White House who can get Clinton, or it's not Clinton, and get Lincoln out of his dark moods, which was quite amazing. He's the only guy that could make Lincoln laugh. And he was disgusted with the president when the first day that Lincoln was in office, he found him out in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue, hailing a newsboy to buy a newspaper. And McManus ran out and grabbed him and brought him back in, said, you can't be the president of the United States and out in the streets looking to buy a newspaper. But the other thing about McManus, who's a character totally forgotten in history, was that he was the only one that Lincoln would trust with his youngest son, Willie, who actually suffered from autism or a form of autism or a form of uh, some mental instability. And McManus was the only guy that the Lincoln family would trust to handle this kid. So you had this guy, McManus, who was very powerful in the White House. And then you have this journalist um, who writes a story about the Hibernian clique in the White House. Now, you know about Biden being Irish, you know about Kennedy being Irish. But the key names in the Lincoln White House are McManus, Burke, O'Brien, O'Leary, Mangan, Murphy, Brooke, Mangan, McManus. Um, these are all people who work around Lincoln every day. The guy who drives his carriage. His footman is a guy called Charlie Forbes from Dublin. Uh, the guy who drives him to the White House and back is Irish. The guy who McManus, the doorman, etc. So this what they call the Hibernian clique, surrounds Lincoln in the White House, and he becomes very enamored of them. And one of them, James Mangan, remembers distinctly going with Lincoln to the old soldier's home, which was where Lincoln spent a lot of the year when it became very hot in Washington. And at the old soldier's home, they weren't old at all. They were in their 40s, most of them. And most of them were Irish, because if you think about it, if you were injured in battle, during the Civil War, you were far less likely to have family if you were Irish because you had emigrated on your own. So the old soldier's home was full of Irish soldiers, many of whom spoke only Gaelic. And that's where Lincoln would spend up to five months of the year, mingling with these soldiers, talking to them and getting to know a lot of their stories, all from Ireland, about what the history of Ireland was about. Again, an area of history that's never been touched. Um, who were these Irish soldiers? What did they teach Lincoln? What did he take away from them? And Mangan remembers going with, with Lincoln, who he described as a complete gentleman. And Lincoln brought a telescope and they went to the old soldier's home and they went and they looked up at the stars. And Lincoln went back into the house, the old soldier's home, and brought out some of these Irish soldiers and had them look through the telescope at the moon and the planets and acted just like just one of them and spoke very movingly to them about their injuries and what had happened to them. So what I'm saying is you have in the White House, you have this Irish click in the old soldier's home, which is where Lincoln spends five to six months and where he drafted the famous Emancipation Proclamation. You have all these Irish people. So you get the beginning of the reality that we've really been written out of history very unfairly in terms of Abraham Lincoln. And that's one of the things my book finds more and more as I went into it, just how much Irish influence 
there was around Lincoln. And he got this group of Hibernian descent around him. Now, that was not the case with Mary Lincoln. And she um, had a major run in with McManus, who she considered far too powerful. This is McManus to doorman. And history historians have speculated the reason she didn't like McManus was she wanted to charge people to get access to Lincoln. And McManus wouldn't allow it. And she dreamt up a pretext of firing McManus, which she did, and replacing him with, guess what, Cornelius O'Leary, a member of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, uh, or at the, at, at the time, whatever the Irish group was, who took over from McManus and allowed her to charge for people to get access to. If you remember the story, Mary Lincoln was constantly short of money, constantly looking for funding. And one of the ways she did it, which her husband was completely unaware of, was charge to get access to him, particularly in the case of people looking for pardons for people who were, um, there was one congressman from Ohio who was prepared to spend a lot of money with Mary Lincoln to get access to Lincoln to ask for a pardon for his deserter son. And again, it's a hidden episode of history, but again, an extraordinary moment. McManus ends up in New York making all kinds of allegations about Mary Lincoln. And she goes absolutely crazy about these allegations and denies them and demands that her husband stop any communication with McManus. So, so we, we don't see McManus appear after he's thrown out of the White House. Instead, we have O'Leary, who's a very different character, uh, who at one point was in the, the, the papal army and fought for the Pope. Uh, but again, a fascinating mix of characters who, and frank, frankly, have been lost to history in a very sad way, in my opinion, when we think back on it. So we come to the Civil War and obviously the role of the Irish and how Lincoln uh, plays that role and how important that role is for him as a president. And remember, after one of the early battles, he goes to the site of, of the Union camp, sees the Irish flag, takes it and kisses it and says, thank God for the Irish. That was witnessed by a member of the Fighting 69th who was swimming in the local river, came out of the river and walked by the camp where Lincoln was standing with some Irish officers when Lincoln made that comment. Again, something that has not been followed up in history, something that's very real. Lincoln had a great devotion and love for the Irish. And it's something that we have not ever seen expressed because it's been really written out of history, thanks to the likes of Ken Burns and people like that. And it's time we reclaim that history, that in fact, Lincoln, far from being an enemy, the Irish was absolutely surrounded by them and enamored of them. And obviously, when you think of the Irish contribution to the American Civil War, you think of three names. I think of three names. You think of the great Thomas Francis Maher, the great Cardinal Hughes, and the great General Corcoran, who were the people who got the Irish on the side of Lincoln in the war. And there's no doubt at all that Thomas Francis Marr, in my opinion, one of the greatest Irishmen who ever lived, if not the greatest Irish American ever, was the man who inspired the Irish to sign up for Lincoln's army. Because there was an awful lot of people in New York at the time who were Irish Democrats, who didn't want anything to do with the slavery issue because what they saw was a Republican party that was anti-Irish. They didn't care for the slavery question. It wasn't their issue. They were just off the boat. They were trying to make a living. They were being drafted into the army and they were looking around saying, who do we follow? Who do we support? And Thomas Francis Marr steps forward and said, we go with Lincoln. And they said to him, well, he's not, he's not who you vote for. And he said, yes, that's true. But the constitution speaks above all else that we cannot divide this country. So Maher is the leader and the Irish, as we all know the story, join in huge numbers, 125,000. And Maher is at the head of the 69th and the bravery in battle endears him to Lincoln. And in fact, there's an incident in the book by the New York Times journalist, whose name escapes me at the moment, about uh, Maher, where Lincoln is not feeling very well. It's just after one of his children has died. 
And Maher is the only person he will meet when he comes to the White House. He turns down every other invitation except meeting with Maher, who he has great admiration and courage and a feeling of a tremendous amount of achievement about what Maher did for him. So obviously Maher's duty and patriotism was incredibly important when you write the story of the Civil War and the story of the Irish. And Maher and Lincoln were extremely close. And in the end, you find Maher going even further than Lincoln and claiming that African-Americans should have the right to vote, which was an extraordinarily radical position at the time, but an indication of what a noble soul he really was that he took from the 1848 uprising in Ireland. He took the liberty, equality, fraternity of, of the French, of the Americans, and of the, the, the quest for freedom of so many countries and embodied it himself and instilled it into his Irish followers. And of course, the, the Cardinal Hughes was the other great figure who I just am lost in admiration for um, because the Catholic Church at the time was very, very bad on slavery. In fact, if you go down south to Savannah, Bishop Lynch, who was an Irishman, who was the Bishop of uh, Savannah at the time, um, actually celebrated slavery, had a hundred slaves himself and talked about how, this is really one of the more awful things in my book, where he talks about, uh, it was okay for, for white men to have sex with black women because it meant that it kept their own wives pure. So there was a tremendous group within the church that was pro the South, pro, pro slavery effectively. But you see Hughes, it's this huge figure, a man who came out from Ireland with nothing and somehow against all the odds, Dagger John ends up as the Cardinal in the, in the greatest uh, diocese in the United States and stays steadfastly with Lincoln, flies the stars and stripes, encourages the Irish to enlist. You can definitely blame him to some extent for the draft riots, but he did put an end to them and in fairness to him at the time, he was clearly terminally ill with, a ca with kidney cancer and he was not the Hughes of old. But the more you read about him and the more you see the letters between him and Lincoln, you realize that Hughes took a very honorable position on the war, on the need for the Irish to stand with Lincoln against slavery. Although, although Hughes did not discuss slavery, did not come out one way or the other, it was clear that he stood for the union above all else and frankly, I think if Hughes had gone the other way, I don't think the Union would have won the Civil War because the Irish, many thousands of the Irish would not have fought because they looked to Hughes for leadership. And I think, again, he's one of our greatest figures, totally under-recognized uh, by history and by, indeed, the Irish-American community. And the third, of course, was General Corcoran. And he was famous for not allowing his troops to salute the Prince of Wales and he was put in jail as a result of that. But again, he fired up the enthusiasm of so many Irish because he stood up to the British, stood up to the, uh, the Prince of Wales and gave his undying love and his commitment to Ireland and to America. So you had these three great figures, Corcoran, um, Hughes and Thomas Francis Marr. Each of them are worth volumes and again, you read the history books and you see constantly their role is downplayed. Their role is not accepted. Maher was an extraordinary character. As I say, if you were to put a gun to my head and say, who was the greatest Irish American? I would think Thomas Francis Maher would have to be my number one in terms of what he did during his life. And of course, his famous speech about the sword and fighting for freedom is one that deserves to be in every history book. Um, so there you had the three great forces that got the Irish to join up. I will deal with the Confederate side and the Irish who joined up there in, in a couple of minutes. But so you had 125,000 Irish and then you have the Civil War and you have these great battles. I'm skipping over here, obviously, but you come to the greatest battle of all where the future of democracy is forever decided, in my opinion, at, at the Battle of Gettysburg. And what happens at the Battle of Gettysburg on the final day? It's Pickett's Charge. And Pickett's Charge is the, is the moment, in, in my opinion, in American history, where if the South breaks through, 
the road to Washington is uninterrupted. You would have the replacement of Lincoln by a military dictatorship. You'd have a military dictatorship in the South. The war would be over and you'd never have heard of this new term democracy. And we have to put that in context. Democracy had only been around since 1776, less than a hundred years after the times we were talking about. So it was still a very untried concept. And as we saw in our own last election, it's still an issue with a lot of people that you don't have to be democratic to take elections. And obviously that's a different story between Trump and, and Biden, but the same issue is for, foremost, do you believe in democracy or do you not? So on the final day at, at uh, Gettysburg, when Pickett's charge begins, they go to the, not to the center of the line, but to the right of the line, they make a huge movement to try and break through. And this is the moment of the civil war where it turns on the Pennsylvania 69th. Right around them, two battalions of other armies, of other uh, units desert when they see Pickett's charge heading straight for them. But the man in charge, Dennis O'Kane from County Derry, tells his men, if anyone, if anyone withdraws, I want you to shoot them. He says to his own men, and he's talking about his own men shooting, we are standing for the Republic. We are standing for everything we did in Ireland, everything this country has given us. Every one of them was Irish born, every single one of them. And they stood in the gap of danger when Pickett's charge came along that left flank. And uh, Dr. Earl Hertz, who was a famous historian, summarized it best. He said, the 65, 69th refused to give way and saved the angle and saved the Battle of Gettysburg. So there you have the Irish, the spat upon, shot down, no nothing hating Irish at the Battle of Gettysburg, standing taller than anyone, Dennis O'Kane leading the way, and they hold the line, despite that a New York unit beside them deserts, another unit deserts, they stand and hold the line at the Battle of Gettysburg. To my mind, one of the greatest moments in Irish-American history that they accepted that they were going to die, but they were fighting for their new country and they would not let them pass. And they did not let them pass. And again, as the historian said, they saved the day. And we hear not enough about that group. We don't know enough about what they did. We don't hear it. And then we have the great priest, Father Corby. And here's a moment when on the second day of the battle, when he mounts the Monument of Stone and he talks as the, as the armies are, are streaming onto the battlefield. And it's the moment when the Irish became American was when Father Corby stands up on that rock and blesses the troops, Catholics, Protestants, atheists, Jews, Germans, Irish, French, Italian, whatever they were, they all stop and are transcended by his message that they're fighting for freedom and they're fighting for religious freedom for physical freedom, for Republican freedom. They're fighting for the Republic. And that is a moment when many of those who Irish who later recall that moment said they felt really a part of this new country, that this Father Corbin stood up and told them, this is what we have to do. And not just aimed at the Irish soldiers, but at the US army, we have to fight for our freedom. We have to fight for it now an amazing moment in history. I'd like to deal with um, the Southern Irish and the estimates of how many fight fought for the Confederate army range from 25 to 50,000. I've no way of knowing which number is correct, but there were certainly brave men, but there's also some fascinating stories about Jefferson Davis, whose family was raised by an Irish nanny um, a woman from, from Galway whose name just escaped me. But she was very influential on the De Jefferson Davis household to the point where Jefferson Davis's daughter wrote a biography of Emmett, of Robert Emmett, to the point where this daughter had Oscar Wilde as an invited guest at her wedding. So that's quite an incredible Irish aspect of the South that we never heard about either, that Jefferson Davis's household was essentially ruled over by this Irish woman, 
for 30 years. He was very good to her, as were all his family. And they all ingested a lot of Irish heritage and pride, especially Jefferson Davis's daughter. Um, there was one extraordinary figure who I had never heard of, Father Patrick Bannon, who was a chaplain on the battlefield for the Confederates. And he was a huge figure, six foot six, a very wealthy background from Dublin. Uh, he had been sent to St. Louis from Dublin as a parish priest. Um, he took great issue with the anti-Catholicism of some of the Union soldiers, which was no doubt part of the anti-Irish part of it too. And he sided with the Confederacy. And he went to every battlefield and he became famous because an awful lot of the chaplains would withdraw before the battle started and rest or wait until the battle was over. Bannon went in with his troops every time and he saved lives on both sides. He gave blessings to Union soldiers, to Confederate soldiers, to everyone who was in need of religious uh, help at a critical time during a battle. And he became so noticeable that Benjamin, the, um, the Secretary of State for the uh, Confederate side wrote, Judah Benjamin wrote to Davis and said, this war is being decided by the number of new troops coming from Ireland joining the Union Army. Because as you will know from General Grant, who basically said, we win this war because we have more soldiers. That's effectively what happened in the American Civil War was eventually the sheer weight of numbers on the, Denver, on the Union side overwhelmed the numbers on the other side. And so Bannon was brought to see Jefferson Davis and told to go to Ireland on a secret mission to get the clergy to stop young Irish coming to America and enlisting in the Union Army and basically trying to equalize the battlefield. So Bannon leaves and goes on one of these uh, these cannon run ships that races to across Europe to Ireland. And Bannon comes to Ireland and talks about how anti-Catholic the Union side is and succeeds in a remarkable way in getting support from a lot of the Irish hierarchy who had been in favor of the Union side, but who knew nothing about the anti-Catholicism on the Union side. And Bannon plays this enormous role, huge public meetings in Ireland massive crowds, six foot six, stands on a soapbox. He goes down to Skibbereen and to, I'm sorry, to Cove, where the ships are leaving from, stands on a box and addresses people leaving and tells them, do not go to America, do not go and fight for the Union because you're going to slaughter. And he lists all the dead people from Gettysburg and how many Irish have died. And the fact is he's so influential that thousands of them literally turn around and go home. And, um, He's just an extraordinary character um, in terms of how he motivates the clergy in Ireland to change their direction from being pro-Union to at very best be neutral or pro-Confederate because of the anti-Catholicism that he talks about. I'll finish up with, uh, I said I'd speak for 50 minutes, I'm on 48. I'll finish up with the night Lincoln died and the extraordinary number of Irish who were around him. On the night he went to Ford Theatre, the guy driving the, the carriage was from Ireland, um, a guy called Francis Burns. The footman was a guy called Charlie Forbes. The detective who was his security was called John Parker. And the people who were waiting at the theatre, a lot of them were Irish Army, US, Irish officers. But Forbes and uh, Burns play particular roles in the death of Lincoln. Forbes is sitting in the ante room, he's the footman, and at the break they go to the pub next door and Parker, the detective who's allegedly in charge of protecting Lincoln, stays in the pub. He's not Irish, he's American. Let me just make that plain. He's not an Irish American. But he stays in the pub and he leaves, he leaves Lincoln uh, on unguarded, but Charlie Par Charlie Forbes sits outside Lincoln's box, and Charlie Forbes was from Dublin. He was a much loved member of the Lincoln family. The AOH and the Irish government 
built a plaque to him in a Washington graveyard about 25 years ago. He is the last guy that John Wilkes Boots meets before he goes in and kills, uh, assassinates President Lincoln. And we we'll never know what happened between Forbes and Booth and how he got past Forbes. But Forbes was not security. He was the footman. He was waiting for the event to be over to bring Lincoln back to the White House. So Wilkes Booth flashes a card, we know that, shows it to Forbes, and then goes in and murders President Lincoln. So this incredible thing happens. And then, of course, everybody is freaking out about how, how, how did this happen, who, and basically the blame falls pretty squarely, historically, in my opinion, on John Parker, who should have been outside the door. He was armed. He would have stopped, allegedly would have stopped, what people think he would have stopped, Booth getting entry to the special area where Lincoln was, but he was in the pub next door drinking. Um, so then the pursuit of Lincoln, as we know, Edward Doherty, is the great name, an Irish American who leads the, the search. And is an extraordinary moment at the end of my book where I trace this fact. Edward Doherty was the guy who led the group that found where Booth was hiding in the barn and where he eventually, Booth was shot dead by a Liverpool Irish guy uh, whose name escapes me. Um, it was a very strange character indeed, but actually had castrated himself at one point uh, because he was uh, quite crazy, but he shot the bullet that killed Booth. But Edward Doherty basically was the key guy in terms of tracking him down. And Edward Doherty is buried in Ireland in Sligo in a graveyard with his family. And around 1890, a general came over from America and he added the name and he went to the grave and he adds this name and he says, Edward Doherty, Avenger of Abraham Lincoln. And then includes just died whenever, March 1911 or whatever, whenever he died. Um, but who this guy was and who he was and why he did this. But you can go to that graveyard today and there is the gravestone saying on Irish soil, Edward Doherty, Avenger of President Lincoln. So at the end, at the beginning, the Irish were everywhere in Lincoln's life. Um, he loved them. He was endeared to them. He had problems with them. They had problems with him. But he was incredible in terms of how he treated them, given the times that were in it. And the fact that people like his law partner and other leading Americans consider them worse than dirt on their heel. Lincoln never did that. And I think the book makes that point very strongly that this is an untold relationship. It needs far more than my book. It needs, you know, a, a thorough look and investigation by historians to just how important the role of the Irish was in the life and career and the love of Abraham Lincoln, who was the greatest American in history, in my opinion. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you, uh, Neil. That's great. Um, it's pretty incredible. I know uh, Dan Taylor was talking about reading uh, the book. We're going to go to Dan first for questions. Anyone on the Zoom may electronically raise your hand and we will promote you into a panelist and we will allow you to ask your question live. And then we will try and get to the questions that came up on our YouTube as well. Dan Taylor. Thank you, Danny. And uh, thank you, Neil, for that uh, wonderful presentation. You, you mentioned early on that a young Abraham Lincoln had memorized Emmett's speech from the dock and would recite it. And to fill in maybe some gaps for some of our viewers, Robert Emmett was a young Dublin barrister who led a, a failed rising. And in 1803, he's in court being sentenced to death for treason. And the judge asks him, do you have anything to say before sentence of death is passed upon you? And of course, Emmett then rises and gives really one of the greatest extemporaneous speeches in history where he provides a litany of uh, the ills the Irish people had suffered under British rule and then ends with the brilliant rhetorical device asking that his epitaph not be written and that he rest in obscurity until Ireland takes her place among the nations of the world. And I would think for young Abraham Lincoln, who's a lawyer um, who wants to develop his skills at oratory, certainly he might memorize that, that speech given just the, the brilliance of it. 
But I would think that in memorizing that and going around reciting it, he would have to have taken on some sense of uh, sympathy and understanding uh, of the plight of the Irish people under British rule. Can, can we agree with that? Absolutely. In fact, um, this is interesting that uh, there is a list in the White House Museum <clears throat> of the 10 songs that Abraham Lincoln and his wife most listened to. And three of them are Irish. One of them is Kathleen Mulvaney, which was a huge song at the time. It would have been as popular as, uh, you know, any song ever written in America at that time. It's about an Irish woman uh, who dies waiting for her lover. Uh, the other was uh, a Thomas Moore song. And the third one was the recitation of the Robert Emmett um, speech from the dock. So they were very aware of it at the time. Emmett was a much bigger figure than we realized. And, and you're absolutely right in terms of learning it as part of a legal training. It was almost standard that you would stand up and recite Emmett's speech uh, in the Lincoln era. And he certainly was able to do it. It's not a short speech either. And uh, I agree it, it, by a process of the curious intellectual nature of the man, he would have probably research, researched it and understood it pretty good, I think. So I think you're right in assuming that. And, and you mentioned, Neil, how influential uh, Maher was. You, you say he might be the, you know, the greatest Irish American in that respect. You mentioned uh, Maher of the sword. He was famous for his speech back in Ireland in support of, of Irish independence and the use of the sword in that respect. And I just want to note that in your book, you have this wonderful chapter on Maher where you talk about him recruiting Irish Americans to the cause of the union. And as you've told us today, you wouldn't expect Irish immigrants to be necessarily supporters of Lincoln since for other reasons, they were politically mostly Democrats. But you recount in, in your book how Maher gives a recruiting speech and he echoes his speech back in Ireland, the, the Maher of the sword speech, when he says that uh, this is the only country where the Irish people can reconstruct themselves and become a power. And then he calls the, the Irish to, to arms by saying, up Irishmen, up, take the sword in hand down to the banks of the Potomac. Certainly just powerful rhetoric coming from a man who was already a hero of these Irish immigrants in, in Irish America at that time. Yeah, Timothy Egan has an amazing scene in his book on Maher, where Maher arrives back into New York, uh, having escaped from Australia, and something like 15,000 people turn up to meet him. And people can't believe it. it is, it's like he's walking on water, that he suddenly reappears and he gives this incredible speech. And, you know, you can almost feel the touch of history of, of the people, thousands surrounding the house where he's living in, chanting his name. And one guy writes about uh, Tom Maher. Tom Maher is amongst us. He has arrived because they all saw him as their savior. They all saw him as a guy who had stood up to the British above all else. And he was, he was well known, not just by the Irish community, but by Americans as a symbol, kind of in the same way, if, if you looked at a Jerry Adams or someone like that, that people have enormous respect for what he stands for, what he's trying to achieve. So I, I think Mara multiplied by a hundred is what you get uh, in terms of the love of the Irish for him at the time. And he had arrived here having escaped from Tasmania, right? Having been transported yeah. by the British. He came in a, in a ship, uh, in the hull of a ship, which was full of uh, wool, I think, or something like that. He was hidden in it and uh, just arrived in New York. And the minute he arrived, everybody goes in crazy and insane. I, I, well, I think thank you. Yeah, thank you, Neil, for uh, addressing this underserved aspect of Irish American history. And we're going to now, I think, turn you over to other members of the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, for everybody's information, uh, we did add the link to our YouTube channel, which will have all four of these webinars on it. This will be on as soon as we conclude today. And now we're going to move to Neil Cosgrove, our Irish American Heritage Month chair. Neil? Yeah. Well, Neil, thank you very much for uh, filling in this gap on, uh, you know, in history. Uh, I, I also want to thank you, too, for the plug for Father Corby, who uh, at that time, it would be Kings County, but he was from Offaly. Um, I, one point I would like to note that you did not mention was is that the Irish were with Lincoln up until his death. 
Uh, I mean, beyond, you know, after he had passed, because it was two Irish nuns. I, I mean, one Irish born, one uh, an Irish immigrant who, uh, excuse me, an uh, Irish Canadian. She was born up in, I think, Montreal, who basically unveiled the uh, Lincoln uh, Grave Monument in uh, Springfield, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Uh, to my question, and funny enough, the, 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 the immigrant, her name was Mar also. Uh, to my question, though, is I wonder if you could speak to the fact, like I said, you're doing yeoman service and filling this gap in our history. But to my mind, there seems to be a, a disturbing trend to not only were the I- Irish airbrushed out of uh, the Civil War in so many respects, but the airbrushing continues to go on. You know, when we're, we're, we're correcting errors in many other areas, this seems to be going on and perhaps maybe even escalating a little bit. I mean, I noticed that in Steven Spielberg's movie on Lincoln, uh, the Irish were, you know, completely uh, removed. And I wonder if you could speak to, you know, what's, you know, why is this going on here? I mean, this, I mean, with the 150th anniversary, there was very, very little mention of the Irish role, which was so pivotal. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think it had a lot to do with Ken Burns, to be honest. Um, I think he wrote the Irish out of the script uh, in a very strange way because he went out of his way not to mention mm-hmm. the moments. Um, and I think that set the tone for historians and it set the tone for how the Irish issue was treated. And I think it'll take some monumental work on our part to put the Irish, everything in, the, in my book is true. Everything in my book, oh, yeah. the, the view that people had was the Irish was were totally opposed to Lincoln is completely false. And you ask most people and they'll say, oh, the Irish and Lincoln have nothing to do with each other. Even from my research, and I'm sure there are historians who would research much deeper, um, there's an incredible story to tell. And I think part of it is, you know, unfortunately, the modern thing that uh, whatever happened, the Irish are no longer as important as they once were, and therefore we don't have to bother with them. And I think that's, that's a sad reflection on what history is these days. And I, unfortunately, the whole view of the Irish is um, been there, done that, you know, St. Patrick's Day is fine, but we don't want to engage them in anything else. Well, I, I do because I think one of the sins is that people do not, uh, you've touched on it, uh, do not understand the complex net, uh, relationship between abolitionists and the fact that uh, almost to a man, they were violent anti-Catholics, uh, you know, uh, probably That's most- the big- hardest thing to retain. Why would the Irish be for the Republican Party when they were anti-Irish? Why would they not vote for Douglas when Douglas was promising them freedom and, you know, right. attention? I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no question that they did the obvious thing, which would serve their own interests, which was, you know, the Republican Party was anti-Irish was more important to them than, than that they were anti-slavery, which was understandable. They'd just come from Ireland. They had their own terrible battle with coffin ships and with everything else. So why wouldn't they be for the party that was more favorable? Uh, correct, right. Which again, like I said, I don't think that's explored enough. And of course, probably, you know, the most famous abolitionist, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, her father was, uh, was responsible for the burning of the convent in Charleston. So, yeah. I mean, th- there's something to be explored there. It really is, and, and what, what bothers me is, um, you know, it's such a profound story and such a true story, and yet history has completely ignored it. Uh, yeah. They almost do it that, oh, the Irish were racist. The Irish were not racist. They were looking at their own situation, saying, look, Douglas is promising us freedoms that we won't get under the Republicans. Why wouldn't we go for Douglas? And that's very understandable in my book. It had nothing to do with racism. Thank you, uh, Neil. Uh, Chris, did you have some uh, comments from uh, YouTube? Sure. So uh, one of the comments, uh, we have a question. Uh, did Lincoln know about Frederick Douglass's to Ireland? And do you think it had any influence on his view of not only the Irish, but of the plight of American slaves? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer if Lincoln knew about it. But seriously, that Douglas trip is incredibly important, even in today's world because it makes my point that far from being racist against him, the Irish gave him a, an enormous welcome. And Daniel O'Connell particularly was, was very, very important in his life. So I think from the point of view of 
proving that the Irish were not racist, Douglas's trip to Ireland is an outstanding example of that. So another uh, question we had was, uh, did John Hay, one of Lincoln's private secretaries, downplay the president's relationship with the Irish when he came to write a biography of him with fellow secretary John McCauley? I think that's probably true. Yeah, I think Hay didn't do enough about it. He, he, you know, the biography is very interesting, but it's, it's very personal. It, it really doesn't deal with huge broad issues. It deals with a personal relationship with Lincoln. So I maybe wouldn't have expected him to deal with the Irish that much, but um, it's a fine, I mean, an awful lot of the facts about Lincoln are known from that biography, but he didn't, no, he did not get into the Irish thing at all. And then we had uh, some questions in regards to the uh, uh, the Civil War and uh, the number of uh, Confederate soldiers and such, but um, we did have a previous webinar, so I would uh, reference folks uh, to check out that webinar as uh, we did have a great talk on the uh, Irish and the uh, Civil War that did cover that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good job, as always. Uh, next for comments and questions, Ned McGinley, our past national president. Ned? Morning, everyone. Uh, I, I, of course, I've, I've known uh, Neil for probably like 30 years, but uh, yeah. we, you know, we you know, younger every year, Ned. Well, tortoise <laughs> enough to be. Both of us were, uh, were there when the government was formed in Northern Ireland, and uh, we were the two of us were there that day when the DUP and, and Sinn Fein uh, helped form the government, and, we, and Ian Paisley and Martin McGinnis walked down the steps together. That's right. I will also say that, by the way, they did not hold hands, they did not shake hands, but Martin McGinnis held his elbow all the way down those big marble steps. <laughs> Martin McGinnis was a wonderful guy. He was. Uh, but Neil, and I've read the book, and I, and I, in fact, I got back in touch with Neil when I read the book and, and complimented on it. It was very well done. I, I would recommend it to everyone. It was a short read, uh, well, very, very powerful, very pointed. Uh, it, it's certainly worthwhile for everyone here on this today. But Neil, I think when you were talking about uh, Lincoln and the Irish, how important that, mo that moment was in Forbes Theater, how important it was that uh, the last person in the line was the footman and he was not supposed to be guarding Lincoln. In fact, they had sent, I think they had sent some people home who were supposed to be guarding Lincoln. It's kind of a sad moment that this would occur because they were not protective enough. And of course, he's the first president to be assassinated. Uh, subsequently, others were assassinated, but he was the first one. So yeah. my, my point would be that I think you make a very good point when they, they always say that the footman was the last guy to, to block the way, but he wasn't, his intent wasn't to block the way. No, and the interesting thing about him, um, everybody made money out of Lincoln's assassination they stole stuff from the White House. They stole stuff from his room. Charlie Forbes would not sell anything, never made a dime, always retained true to the Lincoln family and, and was revered by the Lincoln family subsequently. So, I mean, I think it's an extraordinary. Lincoln brought him to the peace talks with the South um, a few months before he died. So he was an incredibly, and uh, this is where the AOH monument and the Irish government monument is a great idea because he, he, was, he was the Lincoln through and through and he never exploited that relationship and he was probably the only one who didn't. Thank you, uh, Coach McGinley. And we all notice your King's College uh, sweatshirt. Uh, if you don't know, Ned McGinley is in the uh, U.S. Wrestling Hall of Fame as a coach at King's College. So great job, Ned. We're going to move to Martin uh, Galvin. If you're on mute, and then Anthony Bradley, if you have a question, um, your hand was up. Uh, please turn your video on. And well, uh, Martin's going. We'll get you next. Martin, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Danny. And again, I want to congratulate everybody who put the program on. Uh, Neil, I want to ask about uh, Lincoln's attitude towards there were a number of officers. Michael Corcoran would have been one who became famous for refusing to uh, parade the regiment for the Prince of Wales and had to be reinstated, uh, was under threat of court-martial. But there are a number of officers who were 
Athenians who, while in the Union Army, specifically and some in the Confederate Army, were determined to use the military training that they had to try and do something to help Free Ireland, although some wanted to go to Canada, they there, some wanted to go back to Ireland, bring military supplies. What was Lincoln's attitude, given feelings that he had about Robert Emmett, the other things that you've mentioned, what, how sympathetic or what was Lincoln's attitude towards the uh, Fenian sympathies, those who were sympathetic or part of the Fenian movement in the Union Army? That's a great question, Martin, because it was critical. Uh, if he had lived, what would have happened? Um, but uh, we do know that in conversation with um, a number of people, including Maher, he made it very clear he was very sympathetic to the Irish cause. And in fact, when you look at his speeches as a congressman where they were talking about the insurrection in Hungary, he deliberately brings in William Smith O'Brien in the 1848 uprising when he's just a congressman and talks about how you could never trust the British and that they would do nothing in Hungary because of the way they treated the Irish. So I think you can assume from that speech alone and from his conversation with Maher that he was uh, sympathetic and it would be very interesting if he'd lived, if the invasion of Canada had happened. For, what his attitude would have been. Yeah. Right, if he hadn't cut off the supplies like Grant did, you know, could they have gone farther? Could they made some kind of an exchange? Could that have all worked? And we think they were heroes instead of true. Uh, having failed by splitting off of the main boom. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you again. Thank you, Martin. And as uh, I think most of you know, Martin serves as our National Freedom for Ireland chair. And uh, I just want to kind of tip the uh the cup a little bit uh, martin had one of the best ever um fundraisers for freedom for ireland during this COVID time so he really worked hard and showed some great leadership we certainly appreciate that uh next up we're going to have a guest from ireland eamon daly who might have been with ned at the theater with lincoln go ahead eamon <laughs> thank you very much uh danny no my, my question was I'd like to know, what was, did Lincoln have any Irish heritage? What was his nationality? Where were his parents from? His people were English through and through. Uh, he did have some uh, either McBride or a Scots-Irish heritage way back. But generally speaking, they were English. Okay. And his wife was from Ireland or she no, was she Irish? she descended from Irish people, but she wasn't okay. Irish herself. Her great grandfather uh, was from County Longford, but um, there's a town in England I can't remember the name of where that's where the Lincoln family came from originally. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe uh, Lincoln sent money over to Ireland during the famine time as well. At yeah. least that's uh, that shows that he did have such compassion at that time. Liam, if you have any comments or questions, Liam McNabb, our national treasurer. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Neil. This was terrific. And I, I'm in the middle of the CNN series about Lincoln. So this talk was, uh, was, was and it's, it's excellent and, and it's timely. And I think, um, you know, what we've learned during this month and especially with your contributions today, Neil, is, is more about what the Irish have done, certainly to, to contribute to uh, America. And what I liked especially was your research around specific AOH members, right, and their role and uh, in history, and then all the role of all the, the Irish born in the White House who served uh, uh, with Lincoln. So it's, it's terrific. And also um, something that a lot of people don't talk about, at least, you know, I, I haven't done a great deal of research uh, on Lincoln is um, certainly how supportive he was of the Irish. But um, during that time, we know that certainly a lot of rigid views around uh, other other races, other nationalities and ethnicities. He's kind of had a, a, a flexible way of um, um, approaching others, other cultures, and, and he appreciated other people from a, you know, from a human perspective. And um, it, it supports you and others points about how great a, a humanitarian and leader he was. So um, this was terrific all around and uh, uh, thrilled to have listened to it and, and to hear from you directly, Neil. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that the old soldier's home is an unexplored history where he was in constant contact with Irish soldiers, many of whom were badly injured and nowhere else to go. I think he had enormous empathy in him anyway. And I think he felt that way about those soldiers who had nowhere to go, many of them grievously injured. And I think, you know, the scene of the driver and him using the 
telescope to look at the stars and letting the other soldiers. This guy at every level is so humane. He's so understanding of people who are not, you know, successful or in, in dire difficulty. I mean, he, he makes empathy an extraordinary political attribute, which I think is very unusual in a president, but he does it. Neil Cosgrove, our uh, chair of Irish American Heritage Month, uh, put together both of those videos that you can find on our YouTube, the one we opened up with today. He also made sure working with uh, Dan Taylor and his crew and a lot of uh, self-work there, he put together an article every day that came out for Irish American Heritage Month. He worked together with the partnership we had with Irish Central throughout Irish Her American Heritage Month and uh, Neil's crew. Uh, Neil Cosgrove, for any last comments or questions as we go into our wrap up here? No, I, again, well, first of all, thank you, Neil, for, again, for the service you've done in bringing this chapter of history to life. Uh, thank you today for this great talk. And uh, just for those on the, on the conference, I think, though, Neil, it presents a prima facie case for why we need Irish American Heritage Month, that there are so many of these stories that are not being told that, uh, you know, I mean, most importantly, our children are not hearing them. And if we don't stand up, uh, you know, and tell these stories, they're not going to be told. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to mess it up, but, I, you know, Edmund Burke once said that no, no person will look forward to, uh, to their future who does not look back at their ancestors. So, I mean, it's critical that we uh, embrace this and uh, be, be more active in this field. And thank you, Danny, for all the support you've given to this program. Daniel Taylor. Yes, yeah, so I want to thank Neil uh, for being a great final uh, iteration of this Irish Heritage Month series and uh, thank all of our guests we've had this month and, and recognize our national president, Danny O'Connell, who really has led us into the cyber age uh, in response to the COVID pandemic. Uh, this has been a, a wonderful series and we look forward to more to come in the future. Thank you, Dan. And we're getting better every month or every week, I should say. Uh, we've got people from around the country uh, joining us today. Neil, I see our brothers, uh, Brother O'Connor out there in uh, Montana, our brothers from Saratoga uh, up in New York, uh, Amy coming in from uh, Drum the Killy, Ireland, population 103. Uh, <laughs> Niall, uh, there, Neil, uh, your, your closing comments. Well, it's been such a pleasure to talk to an audience that is so open to you know, a great Irish story that is frankly totally untold. And I think what the AOH has done by getting writers like Damien and myself coverage is, is really help people understand that there's so much about the American Civil War, which was probably the most important conflict of the 19th century, that we don't know about our Irish heritage. And to Neil's point, we need to know this. This is critical for us. Like the guys who stood in the gap against the Pickett's charge, People like that who we've never really heard or read about. We need to know about them. And as you said, Neil, our kids need to know about them. It's a very important message. And I'd hate to let it go and say, you know, we don't have to think about this. But our past is our future. And how we remember that past is so critical. And I think we let ourselves down by allowing a storyline that we had very little to do with the American Civil War, whereas, in fact, it's clear that we did have an awful lot to do with it. Thank you very much. And as, um, as I said earlier, everyone online that uh, raised their hand had an opportunity to speak today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that. Judge McKay, um, I know, came in a little bit late, but he was able to get on. Any quick closing comments there, Judge, as we go to the end? Uh, no, sir. It was fabulous. I'm sorry I had several meetings before. I just got the last tail end of it. But thank you so much for including me, Danny. All right. And Everybody, as you know, we always like to end with a little song, and, and this is a, a really a decade of uh, commemorations uh, for Ireland, uh, which really kicked off in 1916, uh, but that was just the beginning. And so as we commemorate, I like to go back to Rockland County. I think it, one of the most Irish per capita counties, if not the most in the United States, for their 1916 commemoration as we close. Thank you all for joining us. This can be found on YouTube. Uh, it'll go live in about six minutes. But thank you. I could not have done it without you, Niall. I 
Neil, I keep saying now. God bless y'all. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Ryan K. Hill